Hello, welcome to the 25th episode of Scary Thoughts, Horror, Philosophy, Culture. I'm Mark Kate. And I'm Chad Lott. This episode is about Death Note, the Netflix live action movie from actually like two weeks ago as of when we're recording this. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should give a little uh, background just to set it up. We chose this movie based on nothing. It was just, I think it came in my email, you might like this, check it out. And I think I just said, hey, let's do that just in case it's worth talking about. I wasn't even clear that it was a horror movie. I, d- I didn't know anything about it. I hadn't seen the manga. I hadn't seen the anime. I didn't know a thing of what it was about. So when I pressed yeah. play on Netflix, it was my first experience with it. Same, same. So we were kind of, I think this is the first episode we've done that we've sort of rolled the dice on like mm-hmm. completely. Everything else we've done, we had either seen before or had good reason to believe was going to be something we wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, so I sort of felt like this would be a, an interesting challenge. Let's get you prepared for next episode, folks. The next one will be about It, the new one from 2017. And this will also be a first. It'll be our first live episode. We'll be recording at Borderlands Books in San Francisco on Valencia Street. And we will be joined by the writer Meg Elson and editor Jeremy Lassen, who also used to work at Borderlands. And that will be on September 17th. That's a Sunday at 3 p.m. And then we will be posting it as our next episode probably like 24 hours later. Yeah, kind of a new and different thing for us. See how it goes. Yeah, it was fun. We uh, actually, all four of us went to go see it together the other night. And I mean, I don't want to start that episode, but it's great. Yeah, I had a really good time. Not just because I had smoked a, an enormous amount of weed before and after. It was shocking. Yeah, I figured like that was the first time I had met them and I totally went for it. So first impressions are important. <laughs> amazing yeah so please go to itunes rate and review this podcast because you love it and while you're online groping around for more scary thoughts content please visit our webpage scarythoughts.org and sign up for our newsletter and stay up to date on our upcoming episodes we always do recommendations and delightful memes from our intern which is still going strong over at uh Instagram at scarythoughts.podcast. You go check out some stuff. I've been experimenting with a little different content just than just memes and stuff, like recommended books and things that we like and just yeah. trying to feel it out, see what you guys are into. Want to talk about spoilers? Yeah. So if you've seen Netflix's Death Note, awesome, because we're going to talk about it as if you have seen it and are not going to be spoiled by anything. And because I had to sit through 37 episodes of the anime, uh, there may be mild spoilers for that, but uh, yeah. I don't think it, there there will be points where I think it will be beneficial to talk about the difference between the two or even possibly three if we talked about the manga at all, the, the three different like ways that this was adapted. Well, there's also a musical. Yeah, there's a musical. Did you see the musical? No, 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 I did not. <laughs> I couldn't find it online, actually. No, no, I couldn't no. find clips or I, anything. I saw like 10 seconds of it online. Yeah. So that's the best I could do. Yeah, I didn't see it. I'm wondering if where we should start with this is maybe talking about not the difference between the Mm -hmm. manga and the anime and the Netflix movie, but to talk about the thing of translating between one culture and another, one platform and another. Yeah, I think that's where a lot of the the broader conversation about this this film begins is that there was a quite a bit of dust up about the controversies over whitewashing and adaptation and cultural insensitivity and whatnot. And in the case of anime and in particular Japanese stories, I mean, there is a a huge history of stories and characters and ideas going back and forth between Hollywood and Japanese cinema. I'm not terribly bothered by it in this particular instance because there have been two Japanese films. There, There is an anime, which like, I always never think of a particular country in anime because anime characters look so distinctive. It's almost like, to me, to me, it's almost like an alternate world where there are just these cartoon entities and there isn't really any sort of you know, depicted race to appropriate or anything like that, uh, which uh, who knows that could be an, like an unpopular opinion. I know anime people are incredibly opinionated. Well, that, well I, I, you know what I'm, I'm going to add to that and confess, I think from both of us that neither of us are anime fans. Mm-hmm. I'm actually, I feel very neutral about anime. I don't particularly like it. I don't particularly dislike it. I think I feel exactly neutral about it. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know much about it. 
So I have zero investment in whether or not this Netflix version of this manga and this anime was authentic or something like that. I've, I, but I generally don't have any investment in any of those gestures, any sort of revamping, reimagining of properties. I sort of don't really care. I'm just, even though I'm a definitely like a horror fan, mm-hmm. I never feel protective of properties. Well, ignorance of source material is no excuse for not being outraged, Mark. I'm outraged about a lot of things, but <laughs> <laughs> anime is not one of them. You know, I'll even go a little bit further. I, I do not like anime at all. Whoa, um, yeah, we just I, lost half our fame. I know, I'm sorry, guys, but like, uh, there's two main reasons. One is the music to me is often grating. It's often, no, uh, to, always. To my, to my ear, it is, it is grating. Yeah. And I, I do not like cartoon voice actors. Like a cartoon voice acting, I don't, if there was some way for them to act more natural. I get it's like a cartoon and it has to be a little bit bigger than life or whatever, but I just, I am just not a fan of those two elements. And th- those, just those two things keep me from enjoying things that I love, like weird ideas, extremely complex storylines, bigger than life things. Like in the conversation we had the other night uh, with some people, we were talking about whether or not cosmic terror has ever been filmed appropriately. I think if it does it exist represented well, it's probably in an anime somewhere, you know, and I'm sure yeah. our readers will be like, oh my God, there's this like Lovecraft tentacle sex porn movie that totally nails it. I want to see that. Tell me. Yeah. So I think that there is, you know, I'm not one of these people who's like, oh, anime sucks. I, there's just two things I don't like to experience that are a barrier for me. But yeah. I will say I love the the Death Note anime. I watched the whole thing. I thought it's it great. was awesome. Yeah. Um, it, it, enough for me to like even be consider my like prejudices about voice acting and stuff like that and yeah. to enjoy some weird stories. Actually, it's funny. Uh, speaking of reconsider, it got me to reconsider the Netflix version because I saw the Netflix movie just cold, knew mm. nothing about it, didn't see the anime, didn't read up on anything first. I just saw the Netflix film and thought it was pretty good. Like, well, this is, this is fun. And then seeing the anime, I was just like, oh. Yeah, I had the ouch, exact same experience. Missed opportunities everywhere. Yeah, I, I feel like if the de- if 2017 Death Note or Net Note or whatever yeah. uh, uh, was the only part of the series that existed, like that was it, yeah. I think that people would probably have seen this movie, had a pretty good response to it. It wouldn't have been like cult classic great or anything like that, but right. there are probably some 13-year-old emo kids would fucking love it and it, yeah. there would be Hot Topic t-shirts and... It's not it, worse than like Jeepers Creepers or Final Destination no. or a lot of like 90s, like sort of like sloppy action horror teen movies. Yeah. And it does have like a real, I, I think there's an effort to, for it to have sort of a, a late 80s, like early 90s vibe to it. I mean, the main character that Nat Wolf, the actor that plays uh, the main character in this light Turner, he looks like Zach Morris crossed with Nicolas Cage to me. <laughs> You know, and then the girl is pretty much a Kirsten Stewart, oh, Twilight yeah. sort of very, very thing, but like with a little bit of spirit of Winona Ryder from Heather's, I think, if you're being generous to that character. It's pretty generous. Yeah, it's exceptionally generous. I like to be that way, you know, flowing power and positivity into the universe. All right. Let's try and talk about the anime as little as possible and focus on the Netflix as much as we can, you know, because mm-hmm. I feel like I want to take that stand because every article I read about Death Note 2017 and every YouTube critique, they all shit all over it and compare it to the anime, shit all over it and compare it to the anime. Mm-hmm. And very infrequently does it take it on its own terms and just say what is good or bad about it in and of itself. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. And if you're looking for the, that sort of thing, I totally recommend the YouTube channel Wisecrack. They Definitely. have two different episodes that I, about Death Note that I think are very smart. One is like a 20 minute long, uh, what is justice yep. question that kind of relates to the anime, which I think is awesome. And then they have a, have all those sirens, should I stop? Nah. Yeah. Oh, I, you know what? I'm just going to take a moment and say that this is yet another episode where San Francisco is having record high temperatures, like 
the hottest days we've ever experienced on record. And uh, so our windows are open. It's, there's just ambient noise. It just can't get away from yep. this heat. This is the mission. Lots of lots of people doing lots of stuff that will ruin the heat their credit makes store. them crazy. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the first Wisecrack episode is just about what is justice. And then there's a shorter version, which is, you know, what was different between the two animes. And I think theirs is the best of all of them because they get to what's important and they get into a little bit of like why those changes matter rather than, you know, lights, a white dude now that's fucking sucks. And yep. why doesn't L have long hair anymore? It's yep. terrible. Like th- those are just really like, there's a lot level. of that on YouTube. Yeah. There's a ton of that stuff, you know? However, I will say in the comparison mm-hmm. that having no investment in the anime or the manga, and then seeing at least the anime, that there are a lot of missed opportunities. There are things about, that we will certainly get into, things about the Netflix version that are problems, that make it a weaker film, Mm -hmm. that were strengths in the originals. And that's disappointing. And I think the biggest thing for me, other than, okay, they took this epically long story and contracted it into a, a pretty short movie, actually, uh, for how much ground they were mm-hmm. trying to cover. But I think the biggest missed opportunity was that um, the main character wasn't very compelling, uh, Mia wasn't very compelling, and Elle was not as connected to the conflict with Light as he could have been. And though that is exactly what the original Death Note is about Mm -hmm. are those relationships and that dynamic. Um, So I don't mind that this is kind of a young adult love story between Mia and Light. I don't care. I don't care. You know, that's not in the original, but like I'll go with it. But it's not a strong love story either. So it's kind of disappointing that they replaced something that was really interesting with something that wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, part of what is interesting about anime and manga version of light is that he's sort of this really bored genius character. And it's not like he's just smart enough to do other kids homework. He's at another level. I mean, he's recognized by other people outside of his community for being this really perfect, intelligent kid. And he's raised by the chief of police or whatever. And he has a, a, like a little sister that he takes care of. And his mom's really nice. He represents kind of like this perfect Japanese school kid. Like he's he's very good. And you would assume that based on all these merits, he would start with this extremely high moral character, but it's it's absent. And then when he's given the death note randomly, really, like Ryuk is just bored and just drops it out of the sky and ultimately has really zero care where it lands. Um, so it lands randomly in front of this kid and it corrupts him pretty much immediately. Yeah. And whereas this character, uh, the 2017 Light, Light Turner, I guess, you know, Turner versus yeah. T- um, Tagami, he has like a motivation to want to use it. Like he wants to settle the score with the guy who killed his mom, and yeah. he's being bullied a little bit harder than Light is in the anime. And so he has motivation for revenge, which is different than being corrupted by the tool. And I think it's just not as strong. Well, the genius aspect makes it like Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty. Totally. Which is a fucking great dynamic. Yeah. Not as good as Face Off. Another Nicolas Cage (laughs) (laughs) joint. Two Uh, sides of the same double mirror. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think in, in, I mean, we're going to be, we're going to be these assholes in the anime. Uh, There, there is that sort of Sherlock versus Moriarty thing. They're, 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 they're equals and there's a certain pleasure between uh, combating each other. And that's something that's missing in this film is that light and L, the dynamic between them is there's, they're basically evenly matched Mm -hmm. and, it's more about the game than it is anything else for them. And yes. Light in the Netflix film, he's just trying not to get caught and it's because he doesn't want to get in trouble, which, which is sort of like we'll eventually start talking about like the Ring of Gyges from Plato's Republic yeah. and how that relates to this whole thing. But like the idea that he just doesn't want to get caught and punished 
is sort of his main motivation for stepping his game up. And he never really does. Like he never really covers his track super well. And yeah. you never get the feeling that he could beat L. Like L's almost supernatural versus this like chump kid from yeah. Seattle. Yeah. And I think the thing that they did to make that possible is introduce it. This movie as more of a romantic, mm -hmm. like a, like a, not a rom-com, but like a, a teen romance movie. But even though Mia's character is a little bit of sort of like a tired, like Lady Macbeth or mm -hmm. um, Ellen Ty from Battlestar Galactica, mm -hmm. even though uh, those are two awesome characters. I mean, I don't want to call that character tired, but it's like, oh, the evil woman who pushes the man to make bad moral choices. I know that this film takes a lot of flack for it being a romance film, but I actually think that the strongest part of this remake is early on, we don't get a lot of his mode. Like why does light suddenly get so invested in, I mean, we know he has motivation because of his, uh, the death of his mother and wanting revenge, but we don't really get why he sinks into this moral question so quickly. And we don't get why Mia is suddenly so bloodthirsty at all. Mm -hmm. However, I kind of loved the like killing fucking montage. It was almost like a vampire movie where the uh, montage of rolling through all these deaths that all these murders that they're committing feels very carnal. And I think that's actually maybe the strongest part of this movie for some reason. Yeah. And that's something I thought like looked great in this movie is I thought a lot of the gore effects and the murders and things like that yeah. it looked pretty cool. And yeah. you know, once again, I'll be like in the anime, uh, it's mostly a heart attack. Like yeah. they, it, it's usually, uh, if you just simply write the rules of the book are that if you just simply write somebody's name down in it and you don't determine any sort of other circumstances by writing it out, uh, within 40 seconds, the person will have a heart attack. And then there's, there's a lot of things that in the anime, like because of the length of it, they set up timing. So there's a lot of these sort of tricks and traps that they use with the logic of the death note. And that I think is one of the pleasures of having a much longer series with the death note is so much of the death note itself is there are these rules. And we always, in previous episodes, we talk about like rules of the film and, and rules this, of engagement. Yeah, rules of engagement. And this, they're, they're incredibly explicit. Yep. You know, like if you, if you write somebody's name down without thinking about their face, they won't die. Like you have to yep. have the name and the face. And that's a pretty interesting rule. And then there's all these rules about like if you give it away or you leave it in one spot for seven days, it'll transfer back to the Shinigami. Yep. And each one of those rules is introduced and it adds like a complexity to the game between light and L. Yeah. And in this, it, it not so much, although the novel uses of the death note and playing with the rules is an integral part of the plot. And I think it's played out pretty well, like for a short film. It is, except I think that the trouble with the rules of engagement of this movie is that what it turns out is that if you have the death note, you're not actually merely able to murder people, you're omnipotent. Mm -hmm. Because the final scene is, you know, the Ferris wheel breaks and then a page is ripped out and it floats perfectly into this burning fire. Which means, as long as you write so-and-so will die, anything else you write on that page will cosmically come to fruition. Which means you're omnipotent because mm -hmm. you could be you could write and then a 747 lands in front of my house with $80 million in gold bullion and no one will ever catch me that this is stolen and, 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 and write your entire life story mm -hmm. as long as there's like so-and-so dies. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that I think is a real problem in this movie. It's first of all, it has a rule that that can't happen. Mm -hmm. It has to be possible. Right. But then, the impossible then happens. And that strikes me as an entire other movie. That makes you more than super, that makes you more than any X-Man, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, although there are things like you, if they somebody caught you, they could just shoot you. Like if you, like if you lost the notebook, you'd be fucked. You know, so you're not like totally omnipotent, but you definitely have but enough But you could power. write, you, like, but I could write, 
This asshole will die of a heart attack and I will live to 120 of natural causes. Well done. And will never be caught for any of my crimes, no matter what they are. You're forcing me to talk about the anime again. No. There, Do it without okay. talking about the anime. Well, okay, so there are... In, in in this film, they do show that there's like a pages and pages and pages and pages of rules, and they don't like they don't talk through all of them because yeah. that's the job of the 37 part series is to go through every single goddamn rule. Like it's yeah, like and then that's part of the thing is like a, a new rule will be introduced, and that affects the plot in some way. And then yeah. and the ep- the episode will unveil like how the it's almost in like Star Trek, you meet a new race of whatever, and then they're in the universe now, and that has implication. Like yeah, it, but I think that the way or the reason why the character murders is because he's like trying to settle the world. Like the biggest problem in all of these versions is that light just sits in front of the fucking TV all day. So you imagine like what news source is he watching to determine who lives and who dies? And this is like a huge, huge thing that I think probably wasn't as much of a conversation in 2003. Yes. And is totally absent in this one. I mean, you could imagine, I mean, just watch Fox for a day and then watch CNN for a day and try to figure out who the bad guys are. Yeah, I mean, you would you would be in pretty weird shape. I mean, like we live in the Bay Area, where like people are. I mean, I imagine that if Michael Myers from Halloween was real and was murdering people here, there would be like a Justice for Michael campaign. You know, the people's <laughs> <laughs> people are so like weird and like they, they just have these ultra peculiar. There, there is no like national moral center anymore, right? Like, there's yeah. just these weird little grievances, grievance fetishes that people have uh, everywhere, everywhere. And you know, like, what's the political motivation of the kid? In some ways, it's better that it's a kid, right? Like, he doesn't know shit, so he's just yeah. like bad guy, kill, 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 kill. But the other side is, it's just a goddamn kid. It makes me think of in uh, like Goodwill Hunting when the psychologist is completely bothered by the brilliance of Will hunting and he just doesn't even have a way in. Then he goes home and he sleeps on it and he's like, oh wait, this is a fucking kid. He doesn't know anything. He has no life experiences. So I wonder if having no life experience versus being poisoned by like media culture, what gives you a, a cleaner conscious for killing? Right, but I think that if this was rolled out like reality, anyone with a moral center of any sort mm-hmm. would at some point discover that they were wrong. I mean, that's that seems to be at the core is even, I mean, that's the thing with capital punishment period is we have this elaborate justice system that is deeply, deeply flawed, but it's, you know, sorry, it's the best we've got mm-hmm. and it fucks up all the time and we can blame racism and we can blame classism and we can blame a lot of reasons for why for specific reasons why it fucks up, but we all have those flaws, whether or not, you know, whether or not, okay, if I had the death note, whether or not I'm, I have oversights because I am racist, Mm -hmm. knowingly or unknowingly, it's like there, I have a million oversights. It's what my news source is. It's what my biases are. It's what I ate for breakfast. Mm -hmm. And so for me to pass judgment on people's lives after I knock off some really obvious candidates, I would start to get into it quickly, get into a territory where I would be making mistakes. And I sort of feel like that's partly what superhero films are often about when Mm -hmm. they address the morality of like, who are you? We don't need vigilantes. Well, the cops aren't doing their job properly. It's like, yeah, but if you leave justice to one person, that person ostensibly has more flaws than a system that we've been building for 200 years. Yeah. That's my hope. You would hope. That's a that's a little bit of my like belief in America at its best. Yeah. Is that the collective system can somehow deliver a better hand of justice than pitchforks and torches. But the collective system, the collective is pitchforks and torches. You know, it it it's only by a, like a higher order of rule of law that you move away from it. But that's what I'm valuing is yeah. the rule of law is rational systems of, you know, of deliberation is, is potentially less flawed than my rage. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. At Fox well, news, for I mean, example. I mean, you know? even America, which is, you know, not 
the greatest system ever, but it's definitely, I think, hit globally and historically one of the better systems. I mean, it, it's distribu- distributed justice. You know, like the, the you are at least in some cases you have a jury of your peers, you have a judge, you're arrested. Like it's it's all you know. You don't have the cop passing judgment on you like Judge yes. Dredd at the scene of the crime. Exactly. You know, and I think that. What the death note does is it does away with due process, you know. Yes. And they talk about this in the Republic, right? Plato's Republic. There, there's a character named Glaucon who I think is Plato's brother or something like that. Sure. There's this conversation about why people are moral, and one character is basically advances the idea through this story about a magical ring that people are really, you know, they're only as good as their options, right? And that ultimately there isn't a sense of morality as much as there is a desire to not be like judged and cast out by the group. So they introduced this this magical ring called the Ring of Gyges, which I think I'm pronouncing correctly. And it, it's pretty much the ring from the Lord of the Rings. You know, you put it on, you turn invisible. And the story of the ring is that the guy who found it uh, slept with the queen, killed her husband, became the new king. So the idea is that no matter, and he was a just person. So the idea is that no matter who you were, having this sort of power would basically ultimately and probably very quickly corrupt you. And your morality is entirely based on some sort of axis of like shame and public social yeah, construction. It's extrinsic. It's yeah. like there's like the idea of like is there intrinsic morality versus extrinsic morality. And um, and I feel like probably similar to where the, the book ends up, which is that there is actually a moral position and it's that you can never pick up the ring. You could never pick up the death note. Like, so the decision to not engage with the thing is really the only moral move you can make because after you've become in contact with the power, you're fucked. Because, I mean, you were like, oh, oh, you kill a couple of obvious people and then you just put it down. There's no way, you know, no. especially if you started to experience... Um, what Light's metric is, he wants to bring peace to the world. So in the film, that does happen. War stops. Like, crime goes down like 70%. And what he's trying to do, which is to create a peaceful new world, and I can't remember if in the film he he's explicit about becoming... Oh, he is. He's like, I'm going to be the god of the new world. Yeah. So he wants to be this new thing. That's the whole reason why he creates the persona of Kira. And the worship of Kira plays out in this film pretty interestingly. At the very end... Or near the end, L has light dead rights. Like he's going to shoot him, and he's like, "This man is Kira." And then this what, this like restaurant worker basically clubs L in the head, back of the head, and you and for a moment, I'm just like, "It's all under control, Mr. Durden." You know, it just gave me that <laughs> kind of like by club feel because he's like takes care of it and he gets away. God damn it! And I thought that was an interesting thing to introduce into the film because playing out in the background of of this story. Uh, across all of its different versions is that the public largely sides with Kira. Yeah. Um, or at least for the most part, or, or at least, and the people who are not siding with Kira are cowed in silence by the the fear of what's going to happen to their lives if yeah. they don't. And to me, that reminds me of the social climate right now with doxing and calling people out and yep. shit like that is like, like you have like all these people who are like, this is the way things should be. And there are other people who are more silent. And that flips depending on what geography you're in, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that's that's totally a random thing. But, I mean, it, it just like the idea of deciding who lives and dies through TV is just not talked about in this film. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think that's definitely a really key component of this is that, again, at some point you're going to fuck up. At some point you're going to start making mistakes. And... I think that another part of if this were to be reality, if you were to get the book, if I was to get Mm. the book, is that you don't actually know what the consequences of your actions are. Mm -hmm. You know, you take out Kim Jong-un, that power vacuum might be infinitely worse. Mm -hmm. You take out Donald Trump, who the fuck knows what would happen to this country? If you were to merely abstractly murder your least favorite people, mm-hmm. your life might get worse than it was in the first place. Yeah. The consequences of invisible murder, of violence without violence, is actually unknown. We don't live in a world where we know how that works. Yeah, there's an old like proverb or something like that I've always loved, which is never take down a fence when you don't know what's on the other side. That's pretty good. And, and to me, like, I mean, you see real world examples of that. Um, 
I've read more than once that there was a tough on crime moment that happened in Chicago where they went in and took all the crime bosses out of the neighborhoods that have all the trouble, like all the major gangs. There was like a sweep and then that was it. They just did a sweep. And then the power vacuum created this new level of warfare that you're basically experiencing there now. And so and it's back to the wire, right? Like at one point yes. they create a hamster dam and it's holding and it, yep. and it actually keeps things kind of in check. And then they disrupt that, destroy that. And then I think, well, no spoilers for the wire. It's yeah, been like 20 will. years, so go suck it. If you, <laughs> uh, but anyway, like there, there's a character that gets killed and then things are worse afterwards. So yeah. like when we were talking off, off mic about, okay, who would be like the first five people you killed? Yeah. It would be very difficult for me to yeah, choose okay. five let's, people. Let's start this back up now that we're on mic. Okay, you get the death note. What? What's up, Chad? Well, I, okay, so there's a couple considerations. Yeah. One is the myth, like being, do you or do you not know the full rules of the death note? Well, they're written. Okay, so I, I, I would read them all because yeah. that's how I am, right? Yeah. And one of the things that's explicitly stated in the death note itself uh, the the larger mythos of the Death Note is that, is that the user of the Death Note will not go to heaven or hell. They will yeah. be stuck in some sort of weird realm. Yeah. And you know there's other realms because there's Shinigamis. There's a Shinigami realm. So for me, I would never use it. Exactly. Because, I mean, you don't know. But then again, if you're a really shitty person, probably going to hell anyway, neutral is probably better than hell. Yep. So who knows, right? Okay. So for me, I wouldn't want to touch it. But if I had to just out the gate, like start killing people. Actually, I think the setup of the movie is pretty good where he is goaded into it Mm -hmm. and then it's more like he sees an opportunity to get like full on revenge about the death of his mother. Mm -hmm. You know, like nothing can drive you to ignore reading the full rules than knowing that you can get secret revenge. So imagine you just like did that. You know what I mean? You're, You're in it. It's too late. You've already... You've already like knocked, abstractly knocked off this person who did you wrong. And now you're like, okay, I've got a death notebook. I'm in. I mean, I might go really hardcore and kill the leader of every single country all at once and say the consequence for leading countries in the way that you've led them is death. Whoever's taking over now needs to know that. Right. And then like, that's probably how I would do it. So you would rather we lived in a series of anarcho-syndicalist collectives? No, not necessarily. Like run your socialist bullshit the way you want to or, you know, run your free market nonsense however you want to. But but like the threat of your greed having a consequence would be real, you know? Right. But you're saying that just the fact that you are a leader means that you are greedy and there's a consequence you just to that held, leadership. You just held to a higher standard. And like, I know that there's probably some, a lot of good ki- people that would die because of it. You nah. know, like if you're gonna killing like a top, you know, I'd probably, and I'd probably kill off the top five tech CEOs too, just because, sure. you know, like, I mean, probably oh, basically like the people at the top, not for any sort of like, class war or anything yeah. like that. I'd probably knock a few nonprofit leaders off too, you know, just right. to prove a point. But the idea is that like there are eyes on leadership now. Right. And Kira is watching you. Right. And so, because I think ultimately the world's pushed really strongly in different di- directions by a pretty small amount of people. So the idea of like going and knocking off like some dude who maybe shot somebody accidentally in a liquor store robbery or something like that. I don't, that's not interesting to me. Like right. if you're trying to control society, you need to go right to the top and just it's fucking the crush, oil companies, crush it's the one bankers, percenters, it's the, but yeah. not because they're evil, but because they have power. Right. You know? Interesting. Yeah. There's another way one could think about this is how could you wield it as power? Like for example, mm-hmm. <laughs> Kamala Harris wins the presidency in the next, um, you know, the next presidency. Okay, the entire Supreme Court dead. So she gets to pick all of them right now. Yeah. But there's also like, what if I'm not endorsing this? But what if you like knocked off Donald Trump, and then one month later you knock off Mike Pence, and then one later you knock off whoever the hell is third, and you just keep doing that until there's no willingness to step up and run the executive branch of the US government mm-hmm. and just it would almost be an experiment like what does america look like if the checks and balances are two and the third is permanently broken 
like no one's willing to enact that well, third prob- branch of government. Probably it, not good. It would be terrible. I, yeah. I'm just saying like, here's a thing you could do. <laughs> yeah. But even my approach of just like willy nilly knocking off the top of every, you know, like cutting the head off of every snake, basically, you don't know that that would be, it's just extreme. You know, yeah. it's just an extreme perspective. Like ultimately, I think the stronger move is just not use the death note and keep it out of play. It's almost like Matthew Broderick in war games. You know, the mm. only way to win the death note game is to not play the death note game. Right. So I, I st- even with it, for me, it's either like I would want to not use it or just do something super crazy. See, what's funny is the way we're talking about this now is what is interesting about super villains mm-hmm. because Lex Luthor in the first Superman movie, let's say, this is his kind of thinking, Mm -hmm. right? What am I going to do with my power in this strategic way? Whereas almost without variation, all superheroes, at least let's just talk about movies. There are a billion superheroes, but like don't map out, okay, my power, it does this thing. Now let me think forward in the way that I can do it's it's generally like I'm strong I smash you mm-hmm. know even if it's aquaman that's it's a variation of that sort of thing and then that I feel extends to other movies that death note the netflix version is a part of which is teen gets a power mm-hmm. like um there's been jumper from 2008 push from 2009 chronicle Colossal isn't a teen movie, but it's a it's another variation of that where it's like it's just this person and then they get this power and what happens? Teen Wolf. Teen Wolf is totally one of those. Unbreakable kind of is, even though, spoiler alert, it's a comic book movie. Um, it kind of is that. But then actually uh, a friend of mine pointed out, you know, while we're talking about Stephen King with it coming up, Carrie and Firestarter are both that. Mm-hmm. Like uh, a young girl or woman gets a power and then how does it unroll? But none of those are particularly methodic that I can think of. I mean, Unbreakable is, but only if you're talking about Glass, mm-hmm. Mr. Glass. Um, Bruce Willis is not like that. He's reactive. Yeah. And did you answer who you would kill? Oh, um, I don't know. I think, okay, assuming that we're talking about the real me. I would probably hem and haw about it and keep the death note out of circulation on some moral grounds. And it would probably, it would probably break me down. Like I think that this question of when you're given power, does it corrupt you? I'm pretty confident I would like hold out for a long time and then eventually fold and use it for what I think is good, but probably would not be good choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause it's so like rare, for you to be able to like catch a murderer in the act or something like that, you yeah. know, and for you to have caught the person means that the the law could have probably been involved yeah. somehow. Um, I guess there's like, I mean, I can't even think of the last really high profile case where somebody got off, right? You know, I mean, outside of like cops, but even then, those, those like most of those stories are so contradictory. Like you would feel like, if, like for instance, I mean. I don't even know what a good example would be. Like, I mean, I'm sure there are people who would think like, well, I would kill the cop that killed Mike Brown, right? But then you start looking at that case and it's a little less clear cut than any news source is leading you to believe. You know, when you look at like, or at least looking at the witness testimony and the forensic testimony, you know, are you that serious about things when you're the holder of the death note? I mean, do you go to... Well, if you were to look at that research as you're describing it mm-hmm. and coming to the conclusion as you're the 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 lack of conclusion as you're right. describing it, you're sort of left with, well, do I take people out where there is absolutely no no question about what happened as mm-hmm. far as I'm able to get evidence, or do you go like, nah, I'm making a point. I'm just right. going to make a fucking point. I mean, because like another way of approaching it is you, you know, you just get the death row records for the entire country yeah. and say, hey, I'm going to save us a bunch of money this year. Wow. And everybody's dead. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, uh, that's another layer to this question is like Japan has the death penalty. Mm-hmm. A lot of America has the death penalty. We're sort of talking about an abstraction of like, what would you do with the death note? But really at the core is like, do you believe in the death penalty? Do you believe that people should, and I'm, I'm not asking you, Chad, because I'm 99.9% sure I know what your answer is. So it's the same, probably the same answer as me. But, um, but what's your answer? Of course. Well, 
I believe in capital punishment. I don't believe the American government should have the power to put anybody to death because it seems to be pretty incompetent at it. That's well, kind of my position. I think I, I have a pretty similar outlook. I, I think I think you inferred correctly. One is I think absolutely some people need killing. Yeah. Like if if there was somebody running towards my wife with a knife and I had a flamethrower, that person would <laughs> fucking burn to death. That is a great scenario. You I mean, just said. I mean, for real. Like that's I, like I would have no compunction about. I mean, even if they were running at my wife with a, a like a water balloon I might burn them to death you know just just like that's how <laughs> aggro I am about that stuff um, but I don't be, I think there's something coarsening to people in a society when the society commits murder yeah and I think actually the justice system as it is you don't see for the amount of murders committed like a statistically high number of like missed calls. It, it's surprisingly accurate to me. I would expect it to be way worse. I would expect it to be way more fallible. And I know that it is. And I know for different communities that it's more fallible and less fallible. But I mean, what I'm getting at there isn't that it's an awesome system. It's just, I think, an improvement over like fucking burning witches and shit, you know? Oh, for yeah, sure. That, that's what I'm getting at is like, there's for sure room for improvement, but I don't think it's as bad as like, you know, it's not a like a, a Roman emperor with his thumb going up and down. You know, there is yes. there is some sort of, I mean, yeah. If you have money, you're fucking stoked with the system, and that's a problem. Yeah. You know, but um, I don't know. Yep. But, but again, okay, you've got the death note. Suddenly, you're like, you're not protecting someone running at someone you love with a balloon. <laughs> with a water balloon. We're talking about like you're about to change the course of history. And I think this goes back to what we were talking about, mm -hmm. about world leaders and who has power versus like, you know, I think that all the death notes are concerned with like criminals. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is an assumption in all these versions that not just the media, but the government that we know that there is something called a criminal mm -hmm. and they are guilty. Right. And that's very different from someone who deserves to die. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like the idea of deserves to die. I to think make the world, is, making the world a better place. Right. Say, so there's, maybe I should put it there's that two way. different things. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so I think the problem of trying to make the world into some sort of utopia versus just righting wrongs are, are different things. Yes. You know, and, and they're both moral questions, but I think with a tool like the Death Note, I mean, you get into, it's the same question about nuclear weaponry, right? Like mm. America has had all the weapons, I mean, Russia has a bunch too, but as far as being one superpower with all the weapons, you're Amer you're the world's cop. Like the last hundred years, like, well, not hundred years, but since World War II, relatively peaceful historically, right? And, and yep. so you're, is that because of this potential world ending nuclear threat? Maybe, I don't know, um, maybe not. Like, I think it's neoliberalism. I think it's... it's the end of, is the death note the true end of history? <laughs> Like, <laughs> yeah, like in the Death Note, like Fukuyama just gets to get, he just writes in there, he goes, every system other than neoliberal democracy dies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just sort of thinking about extending from that. It just sort of reminds me of, um, oh, geez, what's the character from Watchmen? Mr. Universe, the naked blue guy. I can't believe I'm calling him the naked oh, blue Dr. guy. Oh, Dr. Manhattan. Thank you. Yeah, like. Yeah. And it's a little bit like Bran from Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. uh, at least where he is at this point in the series, where it's just kind of like, eh, you know, like why get involved? It's all fucked or something. You know, this sort of like, mm -hmm. uh, it when you back up and just go like human folly, what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm really glad you brought up Watchmen because that is both a, has a much maligned adaptation, but also introduces all these different ideas of what would you do to make society better with varying levels of power? So mm -hmm. you have like the lowest level is probably Rorschach who has Just a dirty trench coat guys. in his fists, yeah. you know, and, but has a much stronger moral center than Dr. Manhattan does. I mean, Dr. Manhattan essentially drifts into nihilism at near, yes. near the end. And yep. even his like relationship with his girlfriend or whatever isn't enough to tether him to the human race. Although it sort of is at uh, he one He goes point, full true detective. Yeah, it, it's a little weird. He has like this peculiar happy ending. Like, hey, I knew it was, it's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then the real deal Nietzschean superhero who's Rorschach like beats his way to the fucking logical conclusion of his life, you know? Yeah. And, and 
there's something more compelling about the way he goes out than the way Dr. Manhattan drifts off. Right. You know, uh, since we've invoked the Nietzsche, um, Go. I, I was thinking, <laughs> there's uh, one of the, there are moments where I do like Mia over Misa. The really? Kid. Yeah. How so? Uh, and there's one scene where she's like, you don't get to feel superior for being a pussy. And I think like that is the most tight way of describing Nietzsche's slave morality critique I've that, ever that heard. That is the most tight motto for Chad Lott I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> it just strikes me as being like the plaque on your fucking desk. Yeah. And, it, it, and like to me, it's more, it's not so much about like whether or not you're a pussy or not. It's about whether or not you fucking feel superior for your bullshit moral call. call. Right. You know, it, 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 it's, I, I liked that moment. Yeah. Um, and then there's a lot of writing about how much more powerful Mia is than Misa is a character. And I mean, you can make that argument, I guess, because she sort of wants to take Kira further and be more extreme. Mm. Like she's definitely like in Scarface, the, the, the woman who ruins the empire, that's kind of her, but she's also like makes it even more like, she's like, Oh, I don't think you're going hard enough basically. Yeah. And I don't know. It's interesting. And then she's attracted to that power too. You know? Very, very quickly. Yeah. Like if the death note disappeared, she would leave him for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, again, that is potentially what is interesting to me is we look at this film and see this romance between these two teenagers that's built on bad faith in some ways. Mm. But if you take that out of what you just said out of it, like, oh, she would leave him in a second. Like, okay, well, what if that's true? Then that's sort of the Bonnie and Clyde, the 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 burning out fast and furious, like like I was saying. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you get this montage where they're like fucking and murdering like vampires, and awesome. That's what their relationship is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Why why would we want it to be anything else? And and just because it's in the format of a young adult novel mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it actually isn't the perfect relationship for that circumstance, you know, hormones and violence. And that's what they're enacting. And well, she would leave him without the death note. Yeah. So what? I mean, maybe he doesn't realize that, but that is the essence of what their relationship is. Mm -hmm. Um, let, okay, so let's table the plot a little bit for a second. Just talk about maybe like the the look of the film. Like I thought it was Netflix originals have this look that I think is pretty good, but for some reason it's never like all the way. Like there's things there, like cameras moving interestingly. Mm -hmm. Like they the, always yeah. seem to get the. They ha always have the budget for a dolly and a crane. Yeah, <laughs> and some I mean, symmetry. They get a lot right. You know, there's some symmetry. There's interesting neon. Like Adam Wingard, the director. You know, he's known for his kind of like neon colors and things yep. like that. And I think that plays out here. And uh, there are some very anime-like shots, like very long slow motion movements of just people walking or like a skyscraper escape or something Seattle. like that yeah seattle yeah and i think that stuff's nice in this mm -hmm. but for some reason like you don't ever get the feeling that later on somebody will be like oh this is so wingardian right you know and it, yeah. it, it, is it because it's so accurate to what it, it like you almost feel like these are like like on the website, you write SEO copy. It's like optimized words that you know will get people's attention. Yeah. And eventually everybody has the same optimized copy. So it sort of like becomes flat. I feel like everybody knows the Kubrick tricks. Everybody knows the Hitchcock perspective stuff. And they know to move the camera. They know yeah. to do these things. And it, it's become, I don't want to say boring. It's just well done. It's just the new normal. Yeah. Yeah. Although... If we jump from how it looks to how it sounds, mm -hmm. the soundtrack, pardon me jumping in tone, but can go fuck itself. Mm. The music choices were garbage, lazy nonsense, mm. completely out of context. Uh, the Chicago and Air Supply yeah. and Take My Breath Away by Berlin were stupid and were really sort of just 
shark jump, shark jump, shark jump. Yeah. I mean, I guess I don't have as visceral a reaction to it yeah. as you do. But I'm also not a musician. I'm not as probably as as for instance, I do not have a music podcast called Why We Listen, <laughs> um, like you do. But I, it just seems like a thing that's happening now. Like the Guardians of the Galaxy declared that all movies that make over a hundred million dollars will now have a a quirky retro soundtrack with yeah. some forgotten hits that are hilariously deployed. Right. But that at, was a comedy. I mean, I don't want to make too many excuses for Guardians of the Galaxy, mm-hmm. but there's a concept there. It's it's about his mixtape and his only connection to his earthling humanity mm-hmm. that he has is are these awesome mixtapes. And so it's it's funny, but it makes sense in the plot somehow yeah. of like, well, that's who he is. He's this cocky, ridiculous kid who for some reason can still listen to his mixtapes from the 80s. Whereas in this movie, it was just so shoehorned in and slapped on top of like, the montages at the end are just disruptive, ruin the momentum of the film. And then the music doesn't fit. Mm-hmm. It doesn't enhance. It actually makes it very corny. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, you know, there's this action sequence and it's got this soft rock song over top of it. I feel like we might be too old for this, like in some ways, because I, mean, I just saw the new Spider-Man movie and yeah. it has scenes like this. Like there's a prom scene that has cooler than it should have been at the time music playing to mm. evoke the 80s because it's right. like an 80s prom. And um, you made this point a few times that like you're not getting the 80s as it was. You're getting the 80s as producers and directors who were cool in the 80s yeah. remember it to be. Yeah. And there are moments, though, I think the, the the score works pretty well. Like I love the scene where the FBI agents are marching off the roof of the building. Is that the, the really synth pulsating yeah, Trump Muller? Yeah. yeah. Well, Trump Muller's fucking great, and he's current. He's contemporary, yeah. even though it's got that sort of like – Glooby synth sound, and I like I like that sort of driving synth in movies right now. It just feels modern and current mm-hmm. in the way like like why are there fucking violins in this no, scene? I, like you know, like there's no agree. reason. So I completely agree, but we don't also don't need Chicago in the middle of an action sequence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or, I don't know. There is another thing we've been bringing up more and more on and off mic with horror films is. In classic horror movies in the 80s, if you were alone in the woods, you would be alone. And now if you're alone in the woods, either your cell phone would save you Mm -hmm. from being completely alone. Or if you're in a movie, you'd have to go like, God damn it, I, you know, no service or my battery's out. Mm -hmm. Because technology is so ubiquitous, it solves a lot of the problems that people had in earlier horror films and all horror films have to contend with this. And I feel like that's why so many horror films are set in the pre mobile phone era Mm -hmm. is you just don't have that problem anymore. Yeah. Or you have the ubiquitous, like I, I don't have any bars, you know, but I think in this film it doesn't have to cross any of that. But this film's version of that is that, there's that scene where Elle is explaining Kira couldn't have had access to this information and nobody accessed it, so it must be someone within the police force. Mm-hmm. And it just sort of glosses over the, fa- over the idea that there's no such thing as a hacker. Um, it's, right. this, it's this total technological flaw in logic that the film just sort of, rather than figures out a way around it. It just sort of lies about the way things actually are. It pulls a, my cell phone is out of juice when it's actually plugged into the wall. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And it also glosses over a little bit that in in the film, this is represented, but there are sort of like Reddit forums of who should die. Yeah. And I, I think that would have been a little more interesting to dive into a little bit because I know that when I want to go learn how to fix my vacuum cleaner there's a reddit form that has a pretty good answer at the top of it or there's a youtube channel that has like a pretty good answer so you know if you were looking for who are the top 10 people you should kill with the death note yeah there's probably a pretty good consensus that you could find online 
I feel like this is a Black Mirror territory. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Netflix. Yeah. We were talking about if you had the death note. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like you are corruptible? I feel like everyone's corruptible. I okay. don't think there's a single human that isn't. Yeah. Because murder is sort of like a high, like when I've been thinking about these other movies that I mentioned, like Carrie Firestarter, Push, mm-hmm. uh, Jumper. You know, it's very easy when thinking about superheroes or superpowers, like what would I do with it? And the idea I can teleport anywhere on the planet, just like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Like how would that sculpt my life? It's like, uh, it might corrupt me a bit. I might find myself like jumping into a mint and dragging a bunch of money out that's completely untraceable or something like that. Right, right. Uh, Trying to find targets where I wouldn't have... uh, I wouldn't feel bad about the consequences, but they're crossing a certain common moral threshold. Mm -hmm. But with Death Note, it is murder and nothing but murder. Right. Which actually was had, I mean, come on, for most of us, that's a pretty high level of moral corruption. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing to say, like, oh, if you could be invisible, would you ever steal? And you go, like, well, I don't believe in stealing. And, like, well, no, at some point you're going to fucking take something that doesn't belong to you. Yeah. You might take it from the government or someone who you think deserves it, but you're corruptible. But murder's fucking, like, high order. However, the death note is interesting because you don't have to be there. You don't have to see it. You don't have to witness it. You mm-hmm. can make it so that it's quite invisible to you. So you're like a drone operator. Right, right. You're, you have this this system of removal, this technology, where you're not getting your hands dirty, even though you're committing the most heinous act a, a human can commit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the train problem, the various train problem philosophy problems, where it's like you know, there, there's a whole bunch of different ones, but it comes down to like if you pulled a switch and your friend was on one track, but there were eight people on the other track, yeah. like would you send the train to kill your one friend or and thereby kill eight strangers or would you save the eight strangers and kill your one friend yeah and for me the eight strangers are gonna die oh sure y- you know like i mean that's just like an honest Sorry. take i'm not gonna lie yeah. there's no reason to lie about it because yeah. it's not a real thing that's happening um the other <laughs> one that's really interesting with those train problems is they have the one where there seems to be some difference between pushing a button and throwing a switch like there's, uh, you know, like, okay, there's one person on one track and then several people on the other track and then you make the choice of who to kill. There seems, for some weird reason, there, there are fewer people willing to throw, to throw the switch than push the button. To me, it makes no difference. The result's the same. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think Sam Harris has gone on over and over about that <laughs> train problem thing quite a bit in the last year or two. Well, I, I mean, it makes me think, what if the Death Note book itself was like, powder blue and had a nice font and had very clean pages would you be less aggressive and nasty in the choices and forms of execution than this like gnarly hella goth thing that we get in the actual film i don't know know? i mean it's like uh the brand guidelines of the shinigami i don't know you'd have to ask them i mean what if it was designed by lisa frank um, Would you like never murder anybody because you just see these Technicolor kitty cats and unicorns and just feel too good about everything to? I mean, I think commit you would just genocide, murder anyway. Like yeah. you know, it might make it worse. You might just like fuck it. I'm just I'm all in on this. Huh. It's murder time. In the film, there are some interesting choices when Watari is hunting down L's true identity. Like first of all. Why would anyone assume Watari was a real name, right? That that's a, I think a really major flaw in yep. this film is that uh, it, uh, once again in the anime there's like a there's something that happens that reveals that character's true name mm-hmm. and allows him to be killed. In this one, they just assume his real name is Watari. I mean, it'd be like trying to kill Prince by writing that Prince. symbol down. Or, you yeah. know, it, it, it's it's kind of silly. Well, uh, also that why didn't Light just have some other person kill Watari? Like this person, before he kills himself, kills the person mm-hmm. known as Watari. Like you can control other people. Why don't you just get that person to go commit There's murder? There's a moment where they could have made L a really more interesting and compelling character is when Watari dies, 
El has sent that task force to go get him, mm-hmm. and then they shoot him. So there's a moment where you're like, okay. I didn't understand. Can you explain that okay. scene to me? So, Watari, so Light wrote down Watari, you know, Watari dies after revealing the name or after finding the name. So he's not specific enough. He goes, he finds the name. He doesn't write down, he tells Light the name, then dies. So he yeah. actually find he fills the... It's kind of like a monkey's paw moment where he does fulfill the the requirements. Like he knows El's real name, and then he dies. And he makes the mistake of the Shinigami. He's like, okay, well, how does he die? And the Shinig like Ryuk is basically tells him like, hey man, what what? And then Light because he's frustrated goes dealer's choice. And so at that moment, Ryuk's like, I'm gonna totally fuck your plan by having him shot to death before he can tell you the name. So that's happening, uh, okay. Okay. Right. but it also reads a little bit, and I mean, I don't know, I, we could be corrected by this, I'm sure, but it, it feels like L has sent those people to shoot Watari before he can reveal the name, thereby like continuing the investigation. Uh, okay, okay. And, but that's, it's not really, it's too murky to, I, to me to really right. make a call. And that's the moment where L potentially becomes corrupted right which is not he's he's never corrupted in the anime and that's kind of one of the things about him that's so cool is he's just for whatever reason he like not only is he a genius but he also seems to be like a moral genius of some sort but i would i, I would have been really game for the movie to walk out a corruption of l you know that that the death note is so toxic that it mm-hmm. takes both Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty down, you know, the choices that they have to make in this attack counterattack. Actually, they both compromise who they are. They Mm -hmm. both have to compromise the morality to compete against each other. I think that L. Licky Stanfield Mm -hmm. is amazing. He was great in Get Out and he's great in this, but I also feel like he's in a different movie. He's kind of the Nicolas Cage of this movie. Mm-hmm. Like he's playing at 11 and really interesting choices, but nobody else is making interesting choices. Everybody else is just like an actor in a movie and he's fucking going for it. Like he's just playing a guitar solo through the whole song, you know? Yeah. Well, I like Keith Stanfield as an actor too. And I, I was actually thinking, I hope he lands in Lovecraft Country eventually. Ooh. Like when they make that. I just think he, there's a, a I mean, he could easily be the main character Atticus. I mean, there, there's a bunch of roles that I could see him fitting into there. And I think he does, he's great in Atlanta. That's a show that I really love. It's just an oddball, surreal movie, or not movie, TV series. But in this, I don't love him as L. There's things I love. Okay, so he gets the he gets a lot of the physical mannerisms of the character down. Yeah. Well, I and, don't even care about the, again, I don't even care about it comparing it to the anime. I just like, this thing, this guy, mm-hmm. this freak, you know, who's playing with all this intensity, I think is super interesting. However, the whole like he was bred in a test tube to be the perfect detective, yeah, is it, such a stupid that's suddenly like, okay, now we're talking now this is really is a comic book movie. So something that's ha- that happens with the character is they basically everything that you would identify as L from the anime and the manga is present in this film. most of it. I mean, there's some stuff that's not or whatever, but it's mostly here. And it's all introduced really quickly. It's introduced within 90 minutes. And the original author and artist of of the manga, they they introduced all the weird stuff that he did really slowly over time. And the reason why they did it and it was so drawn out is because they thought that it would just – like audiences would just find the character corny it, when it mm-hmm. was on. And I thought the character was super fucking corny mm-hmm. when, when I watched the movie, like having not seen it. And now yeah. after having seen – with this weird emo Sherlock Holmes gets up to over like a prolonged series, it's interesting. You're like, oh, he is this weird person and he sits like that for because it reduces his mental acuity if he rests and all this stuff. And the whole thing about him staying up for hours and hours and, and like this weird insomnia, it's it's not articulated like that in any other way than just he has deep bags under his eyes, which I, I think is a little more subtle and more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's fun stuff that Lakeith does, like his running, just the way he runs is so fucking weird mm-hmm. that they basically were like, hey, let's not use this stunt man, and you're gonna do all your stunts <laughs> because 
you know, and there, there are moments where you see him like falling off a of shit that he really does. And I, I appreciate that he was in game and he was all in the character's anger and hysteria, I think is not, I mean, I don't want to be like correct to the character or whatever, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a little weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you get to the, like, I don't like the idea of saying, Oh, it's not right for the character. Cause I mean, look at Hamlet, the way Hamlet's been played a bazillion times, yeah. right? Like there's moments when the to be or not to be seen is really quiet. And there's moments when it's really manic and hilarious. And there's moments when it's mournful. And I, I, I like th- that people do that sort of yeah. stuff. Yeah. But he also does like a lot of his portrayal is almost like what we were talking about in a uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show where the Frankenfurter character is not just their take on Frankenfurter, it's their take on the impression of Frankenfurter. And mm. I, it's almost like he's doing an L impression rather than his own interpretation. And he's doing it credibly, but I would have liked to seen Lakeith Stanfield's raw like take on and interpretation of the character that didn't rely on so much of the imitation of the character. I agree, yeah. but I, I more wish that the other actors in the film stepped up to the uh, expressionistic mm-hmm. level that Stanfield was working. And I think that's excessively pronounced by the fact that the other, the two other main actors are really understated and deadpan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that was a choice, but I, I don't, I, I kind of, I hate talking about what I wish in art, because mm-hmm. it's not mine, but I kind of wish they pushed in, in in a further direction. Like if Light and Mia were just these like disaffected, emotionless, um, nihilistic millennials, mm-hmm. you know, who just didn't give a fuck kind of thing, like Doom Generation type yeah. of thing. I think it would have been stronger, t- but as characters that sort of had character, but kind of didn't, had a little depth but not much they were just kind of flat like it didn't i didn't feel anything for them i didn't get wrapped up in their characters but i feel like if they actually went in the opposite direction where like no you can't get involved in their characters they're dead inside Mm -hmm. it would have made it more interesting yeah i mean who knows do you think that all the same players involved if they had done like a eight-part netflix miniseries it would have been better do you think extended time would have solved some of the problems? I don't even want to call them problems, but just some of the I things think that they're limitations. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I think that the film suffers from not not playing some things out or explaining some things out. But I feel like this film has plenty of other problems that wouldn't have solved by been solved by time, and that some of the problems that would have been solved by time could also have been solved by better script. Like, I feel like this movie could have been a two-hour film just fine Mm -hmm. if they did some editing of the script, cut some things out, introduced just a few more lines of dialogue, and a lot of its problems would have been fine. Well, speaking of cutting things out, I thought you had an interesting comment off mic, which was that you thought the movie would have been better without Ryuk. Yeah. And on one level... That is utterly heretical. I mean, like, Ryuk is, like, one of the coolest things. Like, the character design is so yeah, cool, so that's interesting. Great. But... It doesn't contribute I, to the movie or the plot. I think if you were making, like, a quirky, dark teen romance, simply dropping the Death Note yes. in would have totally worked. But then again, you're not, like, you're not doing Death Note. Like, I mean, th- that character, it'd be like not having Darth Vader in Star Wars or something. You right, know? but at the same time, I, th- I think it would be closer to... We talked about Black Swan... In a previous episode, I think we did not bring up that it was based on an anime. That it was based on this um, anime called Japanese anime called Perfect Blue. I feel like this is the first time I'm hearing this. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I didn't bring it up. It's and if you watch Perfect Blue, it's like so much of Black Swan is based on this anime, but it's not about a ballerina, mm-hmm. and the character has slightly different motivations, and the Aronofsky version is very, very like much darker, mm-hmm. but. It's totally perfect blue. And Black Swan was called Black Swan very properly, but it also kind of could have been called perfect blue. Like, why Mm -hmm. the fuck not? Again, I'm just not precious with these things. 
buy the rights to a movie, do whatever the fuck you want with it, mm-hmm. or to a to a screenplay or a, a, a manga, whatever, and just. I, I know it's heretical, but I also think it would have been a better movie if it was just this kid found this notebook and there isn't this monster hanging over his shoulder. I don't feel like the Rayuk actually added anything to this movie as it is, mm-hmm. other than it added the fact that it was in the original. Yeah, and I, you had to keep it in. Like, no, you don't yeah. have to do anything. Well, they're cool character designs for sure. I mean, it would be like Beetlejuice without Beetlejuice, you know? Like, so I think that you want to keep it. I, I love... But Beetlejuice yeah. without Beetlejuice wouldn't have been a better movie. Right, yeah. This would have been a better oh, movie without Oh, I see what you're Riot. saying. Yeah, but I don't like know. Like it would have streamlined the plot. Mm-hmm. The motivations of Mia and Light would have been less... It would have, We would have been able to focus on what the fuck's going on in their heads, which we don't. Yeah. Um, Reich doesn't provoke the story forward much they, other than give it a more sort of like supernaturalness it that it didn't of, need. Yeah, it also, the film sort of pretends like he's like this, like I've seen a few reviews where they refer to him as this like Japanese trickster god and that's not what he is at all. That's yeah. not what the Shinigami, the Shinigami are essentially these listless, completely devoid of meaning supernatural beings that live in this like ultra boring flat gray world but for some reason they can pop into earth every once in a while and i think even in the anime and the manga the shinigami experience i guess is not utilized very well because okay you have characters who are rationalists right and some people freak out uh, when they see the Shinigami, like like light in the movie does, like when he first sees him, he's like, "Oh fuck shit!" Ah. Right. But it, what? It, it, but he goes really quick to being kind of okay with the existence of this eight foot tall yeah. death god. There, I, you would think that there would be some theological consequence to the discovery of this like external realm with these supernatural creatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you would at least think, okay, what else is out there? Mm-hmm. You know, are there fucking werewolves? <laughs> no, totally. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, I cannot speak for the experience of um, how spirits play out in um, the average Japanese person's life and mind and spirituality mm-hmm. and 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 philosophy. But I can say very emphatically that some guy like Light sees a demon. It like opens up a million questions about mm-hmm. what the fuck. You know, it's not just like, oh, there's this demon. Well, I'll just get used to it. Like, no, <laughs> wait, are there other demons? Where did you come from? What the fuck? Yeah, like, it just opens up too many questions that um, seem almost more important than the Death Notebook itself. Right? I mean, because you, like, the next question is, like, are there any, no one ever asks, are there any consequences to using the Death Note? Although it's explained in the broader mythos that anyone who uses the death note is going to have lots of strife in their life and be miserable and unhappy. And one of the characteristics of light in it, like in the, the original version of light is there's a moment where he's like, I'm stoked. He's like, even with L chasing me and everyone dying around me and all this stuff, he's like, I've never had more meaning in my life than mm-hmm. right now. And then that's something that Mia articulates in the film. She's like, I'm just a fucking cheerleader. And without this, I never have anything. And now I am something. Like, yeah. I am important. And then that sort of makes her, her like, psycho turn make more sense. And when yeah. you're like, okay, look, her behavior actually makes a little bit more sense when you think about that she's gone from complete millennial dissatisfaction to having power and purpose in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And of course she would kill to hold on to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I mean, the misery question is also, that's uh, the ring in Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. and that's the monkey's paw. It's this, you know, we have a deep well of mythology leading to power comes at a cost. Mm-hmm. What did you think of Willem Dafoe as that creature? I just kept thinking like at at any moment he's going to go, ah, Spider-Man, I'll get you. Like it was kind of the same. It was the Green Goblin voice kind of. I don't know if I saw that movie. So, Hmm. or movies, I don't know. Well, his voice is in when James Franco takes over as the Green Goblin, kind of like the Hmm. mask still has Willem Dafoe's voice, but I think he's only the Green Goblin in one 
one movie. I could be totally wrong. Okay. I don't care about superhero movies nope. at all. So yeah, I, I only uh, marginally know what you're talking about. Yeah, I do like the mixture of practical and CGI. I yeah. think is kind of cool because they're for me. You always get the feeling that that character is there. So whenever Nat Wolf is acting alongside Ryuk, I think his performance is better than if he was just staring at like a, an area that right. was going to have a monster there eventually. Yeah. I think acting against the actor is pretty cool. Totally. And I was listening to an interview with the director who was saying that also what you get is the light catches the spines in certain ways. And there's just all this sort of like natural artifacts mm -hmm. of when you actually have objects in a room, things that happen that if it's just purely CGI never happen. And so there, everything's so controlled that you don't get the sort of like magical extra elements of having a costume in a room. Yeah. I, I thought that character is pretty cool. Like the design of it, I think is yeah. just a neat looking character. And sometimes in silhouette, it looks like Groot. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm like, oh, weird, you know. Yeah, that would be a good fight. Oh, like if R Ryuk and, and Groot had the fight? Yeah. I think... Or if Groot found the Death Note. Would he only be able to write I am Groot in it? Oh, and then, wait, can you kill your... Can you commit suicide with the Death Note? That's yeah, not in the yeah. rule book, is it? Yeah, you can kill yourself with the Death Note. Okay, well, I mean, oh, shit. What's a Groot to do? Yeah, I don't know. Although, you know, how smart is th is the book? Does it understand the nuance and meaning in the way he writes? Oh, you know, different things. Right. I mean, it must understand multiple languages because it's probably mm -hmm. not just in English or Japanese or something. So, well, there's it a could probably understand Groot. So late in the series, they're they're in America, and he's suddenly killing American characters. And you see names in Japanese and names in English. So it seems to be that the name has to be put down in its original format for it to count. Okay. So to kill someone, I would need to know how to write their name out in their language, in their native tongue. Mm -hmm. yeah, whatever. Yeah. Or you could have the Shinigami eyes, which are not in the film, right. which is you can make a deal to lose half of your lifespan in exchange for being able to automatically know someone's name right, by looking at them. But then you'd have to be like, hey, man, can you hold still? Because I'm trying to draw these Japanese characters that I don't fully understand. Oh, yeah. If you went to like Mongolia or something or Russia, you'd be fucked. You'd just be like, I can't write these people's names. Yeah, yeah. If there was one person on earth you would give the death note to, who would you want to have the death note? You, Chad. Because I wouldn't use it? <laughs> Because I know that you have my best interests in heart. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe uh, I don't know. I think this is another sort of like really baseline philosophical question. It's like me, because I'm the only one I trust. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you I know, don't... like, but I'm so wrong. What's interesting about this is like, think about it this way. The, I wonder if there's anybody who'd be like, I would give it to Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, like, because they think that that's a good person. And we almost, uh, and we really like every four years give someone almost as much power as true. the death note, you yeah. know? It, and we're always wrong. <laughs> every yeah. four years. Yeah. It's not even yeah. close. Man, I, it's so weird. Like, you know, like Tim Ferriss on his podcast sometimes asks this question. I would give it to Tim Ferriss. Holy you, shit. You no. would give it. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, would be terrible. Actually, no, Sam Harris. That would be, no, that would be interesting. Like, hey, Sam, here, take this. Or mail it to him anonymously and just see what happens to the world. Oh, I think... You know what I mean? Just, like, watch what happens. I mean, I think it would be apparent what would happen, like, with him. I think it would be so easy to guess, which is such a disappointment, which is he would probably just go through the top 50 terrorist, terrorist list and just crush skulls until he thought that he had tamed a world religion and then he would probably move along to the next world religion. Right. And then you'd maybe be in this interesting perspective where like one person could effectively put religion or organized religion out of business. And so that, that would be kind of an interesting yeah. like death note perspective is like, what do you do? What's your priority? What's the world look like when you have taken out the leadership and charlatans 
associated with every major world religion. I mean, do people give up religion or does it become folkish and distributed locally? Right. You know, and then you have a thing where it's like, okay, we'll tolerate, you know, preachers and imams up to a thousand followers. The other one too. Sorry, is, you were starting to say uh, uh, Tim Ferriss and I interrupted you. Was there, oh, I can't was remember. there some magic about to happen? Oh, no. He asked the question sometimes like who has the most punchable face and who would you punch if you could, could get away with it? And That sounds like a Joe Rogan question more than a Tim Ferriss question. And so here's the thing about it is it's, yeah, on one level, you think about fighting or whatever. I think that, I mean, who am I to judge who's punchable? You know, like, or for what reason? It just doesn't seem. The guys who wear sunglasses indoors. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that I think it's most so easy. People, yeah, just, I mean, just look at their clothes. You know, but even then, and it's like, do you know? I mean, no. about them. I mean, I have right. no, no idea. No, no. Um, like, I don't know. Every day, like depending on your news source, you could become completely exacerbated with some sort of person. Like I think my answer, I think Chris Christie's pretty fucking punchable. Like, sure. There's just something about his, like, I don't know, mainly his anti-weed stance makes him incredibly <laughs> punchable to me. <laughs> Uh, especially, you're a single issue voter when it comes to face punching. I mean, well, I'm a single issue voter when it comes to hypocrisy. I mean, where it's like, look, like you've this dude has clearly eaten and drank himself into a, a, yeah. a state of corpulence yeah. that is. He has deep uh, uh, addiction issues yeah, that are perfectly legal. Exactly. And, and like, you know, I'm not trying to like equate decadent living with body size or anything like that. But I think in his particular case, like he's like a fucking Harkonnen. You know, like from what? Dune, like a Harkonnen from Dune. He's just like a, This is the second time you sprang Dune shit on me. I'm oh, sorry. I fucking love it. God, you got to watch Dune or at least re you got to read it, man. It's All like, right. I know it's like 800 pages or whatever, but it's it's Lord of the Rings for sci-fi and it's so got good. It. But Chris Christie, it's like the whole thing with the beach is so gross. Like he shut off all the beaches for one day and then brought his family out to them and, you know... um just all that and like the budding budding up to Trump and then like not getting anything for it. It's yeah. hilarious to me. Like I feel just, like he already got punched. You know? Yeah. I just, yeah. It's just that I would even accept an anti weed stance. F I don't know from anybody who had their shit more together, you know, mm -hmm. or it wasn't known for just a dirty dealing all the time. You know, right. it's just, it's just gross. Fucking slap him. Stop the slap. Did you give your answer for who you wanted to have the death note? Who I'd give it to? Who you'd give it to? Yeah, no, I, mean, I think my, real, yeah. I think my my answer really is like I think I would keep it to myself. Like I think that I I think that I think that I know best, mm -hmm. but I also know that I don't. But I also don't know who I could believe would be a better choice than myself. Because mm -hmm. I put my morality above everybody else's, right? So why would I trust someone else to do better? I might, I might believe someone else might have um, a more, more tenacious grip on being uncompromised by mm -hmm. the power than I might be capable of. But that doesn't mean that their baseline morality is enough like mine that they would sculpt the world in an image that I want to see reflected back. Mm-hmm five years down the line or something like that. Who do you think would be the worst person to have the death note? It's so hard for me not to give the most obvious answer mm -hmm. because, you know, we have someone with, as you just pointed out, like near death note power and just seems like incapable of wielding it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Trumpster. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, as crazy is that's a, that, that I get that answer. That's a solid answer. But I almost feel like a person who actually believed in things would be worse. I think that like an extreme, like a Muslim extremist, because like death has a completely different meaning when you're going to a better place. And the more infidels you take out, the better. <clears throat> like there's not enough room to physically write in the death note all the names that someone who believes that they're getting a higher place in heaven by killing infidels, mm -hmm. like it won't fit, right? Yeah. They just fill up that book in a second. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, you know, when we first saw this movie, I made a, 
you asked me who I would put in the death note and I made a joke about like, can you staple Excel spreadsheets into the death note? Can you export Excel files? Export all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or there'd be like an Equifax hack that <laughs> like to your death note. But like joking aside, like that's part of the population. Like that's real, mm -hmm. you know? And that's just like people who don't believe what I believe, my very small take on the world. Yeah. Uh, some of the writing that I've seen associated with this this adaptation, there's a lot of conversation about, oh, the source material was too big to fit into this format. And I feel like that's a new conversation. Like you used to never hear about, oh, you couldn't, oh, it, obviously it's never going to fit. Like that was never much of a... It would just seem so obvious, right? Anything you were going to make from a book into a movie, you knew that there was going to be some sort of compromises made and that was just a thing. And yeah. it seems with the existence of long form episodes like HBO series and things like that, you can get closer to the source material than ever before. So the criticism of that in films is heightened. And mm. I don't think that film can solve that. Right. But again, being not precious about it, just like, Take what's interesting about it. Take what you want from it. There are lots of movies that are great mm -hmm. that take a story and make something interesting with it. And I'm just going to make a ridiculous assumption that most screenplays ever written, a lot had to be cut out. Mm -hmm. Because when you're writing something, you got to add it down. You got you to gotta trim the fat. So there. It didn't all fit. It didn't all make it. And then you make they shoot the movie. You got to cut some footage out. Everything's mm -hmm. always edited down. And that moving from one format to another, one medium to another, you might lose something. Well, yeah, it's a different medium. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think there's a quality control necessarily happening, unless you're privileging that everything in the quote original is essential. Right. I mean, sometimes it's a failure of translation, no question. Sometimes, like, no, this has too many moving parts that you're trying to cram in. But if you lose some of those moving parts, I think most of the time you can get it down. You know, like, mm -hmm. sorry, you could make Game of Thrones a fucking two hour movie. You can. Are you going to lose a lot? Yes, but you can still tell that fucking story. Yeah, you could tell a version of it. You could tell you could you could make a compelling movie. Yeah, of course. Like somebody could, you yeah. know. But it's weird though that the idea of not being close to the original is a valid criticism, and I just think it's just not. It's not. But it's such a live criticism all the time. I mean, I I think that the Rotten Tomatoes reviews the of this film are pretty low. They're like thirty nine percent or something yeah. like that. And I don't think that this is a 39% film. I just don't. Th I think it's probably judged on its own fairly f f for what it is, which is a movie yeah. that comes along with your Netflix su subscription. Yeah. It's a 70. Sure. Fairly. You know, sure. I, I think. I think a lot of what's happening online, though, like, for example, if you look on IMDb and you look at the user reviews, it's like one, 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 mm -hmm. one. And. It doesn't have a one. It doesn't have a one out of ten star. It's just that all the haters have upvoted all of the one star reviews, mm -hmm. and so it's clearly politically motivated, right? Which is fucking boring. And you know, so there's two. Like, there's the two. There's like the criticism about it being whitewashing, which I don't think people really care about in this particular case because it's all. It's it's so. It's easy to. It's another easy outrage. Mm -hmm. And it's not whitewashing. It's not Ghost in the Shell, for example. It's mm -hmm. a different, whether you give a shit about Ghost in the Shell, it's actually a different thing. It is, it's taking a story and putting it in a different context. And mm -hmm. that's, that's a different gesture than taking a character and changing their race. It's even a different style of film. It, like mm -hmm. like Death Note is, is a police procedural. I yeah. mean, it's basically like supernatural law and order, but with one case, you know? Right. And this is a dark teen film. Yeah. And so I, I think that whole like controversy over whitewashing and then it's like, well, one of the characters is now black. So like obviously it wasn't whitewashed very well. Uh, like it, like it, I see like when you change one character for appeal, like I think the in Ghost in the Shell, like the one character 
it, like it's still in Japan, right, or something like that, or sort of. Yeah, I who gives a shit uh, about that movie? Not like I mean, the, obviously the question of like adaptation and appropriation is live and important, but go fuck Ghost in the Shell. Uh, <laughs> uh, but like, okay, so once you're at that point, you're like, okay, this movie was whitewashed. Now what? Like, say, say, say that's granted. Like, you're like, yeah, it happened. It's fucked up, and everybody involved is going to get two years in jail. But this movie still exists. Now, yeah. how do you talk about this movie? Right. And I think it, like, the thirty nine percent is unwarranted. I, I don't yeah. think. I think there, like, there are good acting moments in yeah. this film. I think that the premise is so interesting mm-hmm. that it made me go, me who hates watching long form fucking television. Because I just don't want to s- sit in front of a screen that much, and I don't like anime. So, like, says the guy who does a horror movie podcast, right? But like, that's a film. Like <laughs> know, one of the kidding, reasons, kidding. one of the reasons why I'm so hesitant to do things like, say, a True Detective or a Buffy yeah. or something like that is, like, I have to watch those things a couple times yeah. to really do it. And I don't, I just don't have eight seasons three times in me yeah. for for television. I mean, I, I sit at work and look at a screen all day. So when I come home, I want to read books or watch a movie and then think about it afterwards. Yeah. But yeah, I'm probably not the best choice for a horror movie podcast, dude, since I don't like watching anime. I'm getting a new yeah. co-host. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to go on to like my, my new idea for a show. Did I ever tell you about it? I, so I want to do a YouTube show called... Someone might be listening who's like, I'm giving this guy money. Well, so. Look, if you have a pet company, you're for sure going to want to give me money. It, the show is called Heavy Metal Barking Lot and it's just me no. at the dog park with extreme music fans and creators with our dogs talking about music and our dogs. Oh. It's like basically Oh, that's like, great. Yeah. It, it's just like, you know, imagine me and James Hetfield walking our dogs, talking about stuff. So, that sounds kind of like Jerry Seinfeld's Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee or whatever it's called. Yeah, I can. But with dogs. Yeah. I mean, look, based on the success of that show, this is going to crush it. Yeah. You know? What if Death Note could only erase bands? Oh, that's a totally different conversation. They would def- yeah, I and, did, I'm, and like, I'm, I'm introducing uh, it right fuck, now. Fuck, man. Uh, Amiibo would be down to probably one row. Yeah. Like, I mean, I would just... It, okay, so do you get to kill the people in the band or just or eliminate... Maybe break, let's say break them up. Let, I don't, let's not kill people for making shitty music. Okay, in the Death Note, you can obliterate the ability to listen to any of their back catalog. But you have to take out all of it. So if you like Sweet Emotion by Aerosmith, yeah. you would have to get rid of it if you put Aerosmith in Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I sort of think almost, even though it erased a lot of music that I like, just to make it simple, all bands that fused punk, funk, and metal, and ska mm-hmm. in the 80s into the 90s, gone. So Red Hot Chili Peppers. With rap. Up at the top. Well, I'm I'm, try, I'm trying to el- eliminate the Red Hot Chili Peppers at the expense of like Fungo Mungo or something. You would probably or twenty four seven spies. Well, if you want, sorry, to, if you want to kill at the roots, that means you probably have to kill Fishbone. Uh, I want Fishbone in, but you know, or the Bad Brains. I mean, that sounds harsh, but if you wanted to eliminate all that that came after, yeah, it's like. You know, you wouldn't kill the HR department at Skynet. You want to go kill that one guy who invented right. Skynet. Right. right. Um, I would probably kill Kraftwerk. I want to stop what? techno music in its fucking tracks. And Holy I would shit. go back and just eliminate it. Or maybe You're whoever. You're so wrong. <laughs> You're so wrong. <laughs> I'm talking about the good for the good of fut- the future, though. Like, no. just nobody listen. No, just techno. <laughs> All of it. Techno's the only music that matters anymore. I don't... What's wrong with you? Because it choked out the... It is the SEO copy of music. I mean, it's just like perfectly designed to make people nod their heads and be happy and drink vodka Red Bull. I mean, it needs to be eliminated. I don't, I don't think we have enough time to <laughs> discuss how wrong you are. Is there somebody before Kraftwerk that could be a more efficient kill? Like that if I stop then I stop I stop mostly I want to stop Moby. Moby's amazing. <laughs> what the hell is the matter with you? We have to wrap this fucking thing up. We have to we have to we have to fight this out this off is your, mic. This is your idea. Holy shit. Uh, I regret it. 
leave the death note alone. Okay, let's fade to black and roll the credits. Please subscribe, rate on iTunes and Stitcher. Tell your friends, join our mailing list, and we'll see you next time for It, which we're doing live at Borderlands on September 17th at 3 p.m. in San Francisco. And shortly thereafter, there will be a great episode about it. Go to the theater. See it in the theater. It's so worth seeing in the theater. Yeah, It is a film that... I think really rewards the, the cinema experience. I mean, it's it just like all the the new horror effects associated with Pennywise or Funhouse style. Yeah. So, go see it wherever it's most deafening. I yeah. think is the is the thing that loud do. sound is yeah. really yeah. part of this film. Yeah. All right, love you, Moby. Thanks for listening. You suck, Moby. I totally lost. What was I saying? Fuck. I'll have to go back to the shit.